Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Williams. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S, that is, at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four. Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Radamic Berto Willis, your host. Thank you so kindly for being a part of the show. We are going to have a great show for you today after that good old cough. Um, to, uh, Nancy Pelosi came out today with HR3. Remember that number, HR3. Let me go ahead and get the program started. And, um, and, and then we are going to discuss HR3. This is a bill who is intent, or a bill that is intent on bringing down the cost of drugs. And as you know, the cost of drugs, ridiculously high. In as much as the truth of the matter is, most of the drugs developed, most of the drugs developed, don't let anybody fool you. Come from the public intellect. It comes from universities. <clears throat> it comes from people who are trained at universities, etc. cetera, with, the, with corporations taking advantage of all the profits and sucking it to you. Remember that. We have to get this in our heads when people start telling us, you can't do that. That is not the way things are supposed to work. Folks, I want you to be completely woke. I know, Egberto, I heard you, I heard you, I heard you. So we have to be ready. We have to be ready to, be, to tell folks, hey, this is how things really work. We are no longer going to tolerate that. Anyhow, let's get busy and start the program, and let's start it this way. Wait, today's title of the program is New Report Shows Obscene Healthcare Profits as Americans Struggle to Pay. That's the title that I gave the show today, based on an Axios report, that is. As the GOP and centrist Democrats fight to stall Medicare for all, plutocrats continue the exploitation of our taxes and hard earned healthcare dollars. Think about it. I want you guys, anybody who's listening to me right now, Think about the amount of money. If you are working for somebody, it's, it's quite a bit better. Uh, but how much money you are paying every single week, every single pay period, every single month on your health care bills, on your deductibles. Think about all of that and add it up in your head and see what it costs, right? And then also, that's not the only cost of your plan, right? The cost of your plan also includes what your employer is actually paying so calculate that as well, because remember, money is paid to the insurance company on your behalf. In other words, if a company tells you, okay, one of the benefits we're giving you is we're giving you health insurance. Remember, that benefit that they're giving you as health insurance is our wages that you aren't going to otherwise have. You know, there's no magic here. I mean, we have a way of playing with numbers in such a manner that people think it's better. You know, I mean, for the longest time, people have been saying... Wages have stagnated for such a long time, which is true. But what has also happened is employer cost of health insurance have skyrocketed. But you know what is so interesting? Yes, it has skyrocketed, which kept uh, a, temper, uh, a temper on, on your, your wages. But I, I, I would wager, I would wager that if you take a look at the people who own meaning the big stock shareholders. I'm not talking about a, somebody who has a few hundred thousand dollars in a mutual fund or something like that. I'm talking about 
the the multi quasi millionaires that are own, that own the stocks in let's say fit uh, uh Cigna, I bet they're the same one who owns stocks in all these different public companies that most people work for because it forms a part of their portfolio. So when they come and they, they this this one is uh, charging high rates for healthcare insurance, and <clears throat> your company, let's say that be Data General or whatever, is limiting the increase in your wages because they're paying more. I want you guys to see the, the obscenity here, right? If I am a company or if I'm a person, a rich, wealthy person who owns stocks in, let's say, an insurance company and also owns stocks in your, empl your, your employer. So I own, own stock in the insurance company and I own stock in the company that employs you. Guess what's magical there? That's the perfect way for me to maximize my income. Why is that the case? Let me explain. Because I can consider keep tamping down your wages because healthcare goes up. But when healthcare prices, the healthcare insurance prices go up, who are the profiteers on that? The person who owns the health insurance company, the person who owns the hospital company, the person. And if you, if your portfolio is comprised <coughs> of all of those pieces. Guess what happens? It then turns out that you are profiting from tamping down on these wages you're giving these people. Because when you charge, when you, one company charges more insurance, that comes out of their w otherwise wages that would have been given to them. And when you don't give that, many, that high a, a wage hike, what then happens again? Oh... I don't have that huge salary budget. So I take things out as expenses out of one company, which becomes income into the other. I don't know if folks really understand how these things actually work. So anyhow, the subtitle is, as the GOP and centrist Democrats fight to stall Medicare for all, plutocrats continue the exploitation of our taxes and hard-earned healthcare dollars. Okay. Uh, as Americans, are, or rather, according to Axios, healthcare profits explode. As Americans are suffering because of insurance, they either don't have or are unable to use, because of prohibitively high deductibles, the healthcare industrial complex is awash in profits. Those profits were effectively extorted from Americans, because the truth of the matter is, you must have them. You can't, you have to have your health insurance. We all know that you are required to have your health insurance. So, where do we go from here? There are two videos that I have, to, I want to play you, but I, I played you these before uh, to some people who've seen it, but it has to do with Medicare for All and, and how we can be our worst enemies. But before we go there, I want to give the premise of the program as follows. Because what we're going to talk about is these insurance, uh, how, the, 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 what's happening within first the healthcare industry, meaning the drug, the pharmaceuticals. Then we're going to go into exactly who's profiting. You know, we have a whole spreadsheet of the profits. And then we're going to talk about the Medicare for All and those folks who are post Medicare for All. And in the process, if you want to call in and have some questions answered or whatever, please give me a call at 646. 716-5812. Again, that is 646-716-5812. So Axios reported, the healthcare in this is as Axios uh, speaking here. The healthcare industry continued to rake in record level profits in the second quarter. With its year-over-year -year earnings increasing, listen to this. Remember, their year-to-year -year earnings increasing. 23% according to Axios analysis of 160 companies. The bottom line, pharmaceutical firms and hospitals in particular are reaping some of the largest rewards even amid the sustained public furor over drug prices and surprise medical bills. So what am I going to do? Later, I'm going to show you uh, 
HR3, which is supposed to mitigate at least the drug portion of this. And when you see HR3, and, I, I, and when I talk about HR3, what I hope to show is, folks, they're all on the take. This is simple math and the hoops that we go through so that we can hide how these guys pill for us and the politicians with the aid of politicians. It, it is mind boggling and it is the reason why in 2020 we don't only have to take the House, take the Senate, take the Congress, but we have to be cognizant of who we're putting in those offices. Because we need to put some, the people that we need to put in those offices are people that are not going to be wards of these companies, but are going to be out there working for our best interests. I mean, when I read, I, I read the, the, the summary for HR3, Nancy Pelosi released it today. And after reading HR3, I, I didn't get a headache. I don't get a headache for reading stuff like this. I sit down and I'm like, who are you working for? Why does it have to sound like this? Why does it need to have a level of complexity like this? And that level of complexity is not for you. It is protect, it's to protect the pharmaceutical industries. But anyhow, where does it stand? We updated or they, they updated their healthcare tracking, and I'm going to go through some of those numbers in a little bit. But by the numbers, Big Pharma remains the cash king. Big Pharma cash king. Drug companies collected almost half of all healthcare profit despite generating less than 20% of the industry revenue. So when you hear them talk about the reason why we have to have these drug prices so high is for research and development. But most of their money goes into marketing. Most of their money goes into uh, kickbacks to doctors to really get them to push a drug because remember if a doctor is seeing 20 20 30 people per day right and they give them a they could give them a week vacation somewhere if they can convince that doctor to to subscribe their the, the, a family of drugs from this particular company over and over again to the 30 or let's just say to 50 percent of his people the 15 to 20 people Every single day that doctor is in there working, that's a hell of a marketing budget and a hell of an investment, but the returns are huge. And you know what shows the returns? When you look at the bottom line on that company, it shows it. But then again, then they tell the Congress, oh, we can't reduce these prices because if we reduce these prices, you know what happens to research and development. Well, hell, I can tell you what happened to research and development. Not a damn thing. Because most of the research and development is not going to occur on, on these guys. These guys are only going to take a drug when they kind of have a feeling it's going to be feasible, right? And even at times when the drug isn't feasible, if they can get a, they'll say, okay, it may, uh, the, the cancer deaths, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's statistically significant. This, using this new drug, the survival rate is statistically significant, and sometimes we're talking 2-3%, right? I'll tell you straight up. If I have some sort of a disease, and I have a drug that's out of patent that costs $10, and there's a drug in patent that's going to cost me $1,000, and they say, oh, it has a success rate, uh, rather, an improved rate of survival of 3%. I'm going to say, hell no. Make sure that money stays back so that my, 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 my family can use that money to do something with then to go ahead and give it to the pharmaceutical companies. I'd rather die. And I, I really mean that. I've already, I have my DNR, I got everything. Because I am not, and we should not, to, uh, to try to extend life based on many times not real data anyhow, or significant data anyhow. Why pill? Why pill for ourselves or allow them to pill for us? Doesn't make any sense. Pill for a lot of them, you know, pill for us at all. Don't make any sense. Anyhow, drug companies collected almost half of all healthcare profits despite generating less than 20% of the industry revenue. 12 of 16 more profitable companies in Q2 were pharmaceutical companies. Again, let me repeat that. 12 of the 16 
12 of the 16 companies that made the most money, the largest profits, were pharmaceutical companies. Does that tell you something? Does that sound like an industry in trouble? Does that sound like an industry that needs the protection of all these politicians that are out there protecting them? I don't think so. But they're there. They're there protecting them. Okay, so continuing that, uh, the other piece is this theme should sound familiar. The intrigue, hospitals don't retain as much money as drug companies, but their prices and Wall Street investments are still leading to sizable windfalls. The combined net profit margin for this sample of hospital systems was, guess what? For hospitals, 8.6%. That's lower than the extremely profitable first quarter hospitals had, but above average for the entire group. So, you know, they, they make you believe like, oh, they're suffering and that's the reason why these prices... No, every time these prices go up, it's for exactly the same things that I've told you before. Inf it, it's, it's completely detached from real inflation. It's completely detached from prices going up. These prices go up because the wealthy who are invested in these companies want a particular relatively guaranteed return. And the only way to do that is to take your money and give it to them. Remember, that's what it is. They're saying, oh, we got to make sure that that stockholder gets an increased return. Even though inflation hasn't moved and he hasn't done a damn thing, right? He's sitting down at his pool drinking some tea. Looking at the stock market saying, I wonder what's my dividend going to be this quarter. For doing nothing, right? Oh, but I have my capital invested. Oh, yeah, really? And then they make a killing. So that is not the way uh, things should really be. But anyhow, let me just kind of give you a few numbers here. We had uh, at the, uh, at the top, top of the chain here, uh, let's see which, which company I want to give you. You take a look at a company like uh, Eli uh, Johnson & Johnson, 27%. Listen to me. They had a net profit margin of 27.3%. Now, think about the billions of dollars that we put into, the, into health care. And you see the extreme the extreme nature of what we're talking about. And the thing about it, folks, is many people still, with all these things that we know, want to give these guys a break because somehow their marketing tells them, oh, they deserve a break. Now, in as much as Nancy's trying to do some helping, I don't know how much helping I consider that, Moscow Mitch says, yet to cut in into drug companies, massive profits and saving Medicare money, according to Daily Coast. The Medicare prescription drug plan House Speaker Nancy Pelosi introduced Thursday coincided with the release of an Axios analysis, the one that I just told you about, showing that the healthcare industry continued to rake in record level profits in the second quarter with its year-over-year -year earnings by 23%. Not at all shocking. Mitch McConnell wants big pharmaceutical to keep every penny. Pharmaceutical firms and hospitals are at the top of the heap, Axios said, in raking in the most money and will, will be aided by the Trump tax cuts. Big Pharma remains the cash king, says Axios. Drug companies collected almost half of everything. Given that you'd think that finding a way to save the federal government the taxpayer money by negotiating drug prices for Medicare would be a no-brainer for Congress, wouldn't you? Of course. Think about it. Congress is the one paying the Medicare, Medicare bill. I'm talking about Medicare for all, the current Medicare bill. Why in the hell wouldn't they want to negotiate prices? Tell me. Why wouldn't they want to negotiate prices? Because they don't really care about you. And this is what you have to understand. Forget about your ideology. These guys do not care about you. What they really care about is they care about ensuring that their suppliers of cash to their campaigns, to their funds that 
will have millions of dollars by the time they're ready to retire will remain with them. What, what drives me crazy, what behooves me is the amount of people that are out there that will continue over and over and over to try to find a defense for these people that are simply ripping you off. It's a transfer. It is nothing more than a legal transfer. of. It, it's better than a tax because at least a tax, uh, the government tells you this is what you're being taxed. But that's not what hap happens with these guys. You are sim they simply take your money. You get sick, you have to be cured, and you would pay whatever they tell you is necessary to cure you. Right? And that is where they have you between a rock and a hard place. Unlike any other industry, when they tell you you're going to pay this, all you can say is how much and yes or die. In my case, depending on the cost, I'll say, let me die. Let me die. What I'm hoping for is before that reality occurs, that we can say, guess what? We are going to have Medicare for all. Medicare for all, because Medicare for all is the only thing that is out there that's going to save you. What I want to do now, before I go into the HR3, and I'm going to go into HR3 and show you the danger that even those who should be our friends aren't necessarily our friends as they should be. So what we'll do first, though, is what I want to do is I want to play you uh, one of the videos first. The first one is going to be showing you that there's a conspiracy, if you will, between... Uh, who, what would I say, between Democrat, es Democratic establishment and the Republican establishment. Check this out. Today on This Week with George Stephanopoulos, something fantastic happened. We saw the left rail and the right rail working together. We saw Ram Emanuel and Governor Christie. We saw a Democrat and a Republican coming out together to slam Medicare for all and lie to the American people that somehow, if that is affected, that would be bad for them. And they had all the excuse and right-wing talking points to do it. So check it out, and then we'll talk on the other side. Health care is a single issue that Democrats have a 35-point advantage on. President Trump is trying to do everything he can to narrow that down. We've taken a position so far, and the candidates have, through the process, a few have not, about on basically Medicare for all, which is we're going to eliminate 150 million people's health care, and we're going to provide health care for people that just come over the border. That is an untenable position for the general election. I, as you know, George, I just biked around Lake Michigan nearly a thousand miles through Michigan and Wisconsin, two really important states. Nobody at a diner ran at me and said, take my health care away. Nobody. This is, this is reckless as it relates to, and you don't have to take the position to win the primary, and you're basically literally hindering yourself for the general election. I was in central Pennsylvania yesterday and walked into a diner to get something to eat, and a woman came up to me, Governor, please tell the president to tell these Democrats to leave my health care alone. Now, you know, this was the only thing she said to me. Then she said thank you, and she walked away unsolicited. That's that part of Pennsylvania is going to be key to what's going to happen in Pennsylvania. And if the president holds that coalition and wins Pennsylvania, this election is but, over. That but same did you respond and say, but the president wants to re repeal your health care without a replacement? And no, I was worried about that. I got to tell you the truth. I wasn't worried about that, but it tells you what's I, on people's minds. Uh, the key point is exactly here, which is I can continue to believe the president's budget is the largest cut in Medicare ever by a president. And I don't understand. We'll talk about Medicare for all this coming debate down in Houston. Why nobody mentions the fact that the President of the United States has a Medicare cut for all. And that is his greatest vulnerability. He has a, and he pledged, and it's not just a health care issue, he pledged in 2016 he would never touch Medicare and Medicaid, and that's exactly what his budget has President done. 
Now, they're trying to fool you into believing that these concepts are mutually exclusive. In other words, you can't talk about Medicare for all at the same time that you're talking about the president cutting Medicare. Remember, the president cutting Medicare as well as Medicaid has nothing to do with us passing Medicare for all. Medicare for all is a completely new thing altogether that gives every American citizen health care and uh, with a walk-in card that you have no problem getting it and that won't bankrupt you. That 150 million people that will lose their health care that they're talking about, nobody wants to lose their health care. They are losing absolutely nothing. They are gaining. But you see how they work together. The left rail and the right rail are working together to screw Americans. That is what we're talking about. And then when they talk about, oh, uh, well, you know, uh, they're going to give those people coming from across the border health care you know what they forget to tell you if somebody comes across the border and gets pneumonia here in the united states they don't say throw them back over the border at all they say okay we're going to patch you up here no matter what happens so what medicare for all has always done is bring honesty into the health care which means they're not going to offload the offload the cost of the uh, 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 undocumented citizen, uh, undocumented people in the country onto those who have private insurance, which is what's done right now. Everything is accounted for honestly. Medicare for all is not, it's the right way to go. And what these guys are attempting to do is really immoral. It is evil because they're lying to Americans, scaring Americans into a private system. Okay. So, uh, as you can see, Chris Christie and Rahm Emanuel working together, working together. And, you know, you can say, oh, they just don't, ideologically, they just don't stand for Medicare. No, that's not it. Ideologically, what they're doing is they're supporting their masters. They are wards to these corporate interests that actually want to maintain a system that robs you. And I'm going to give you a, an example of that. But before that, let me go ahead and start talking to the folks who have questions. Masticator says... Uh, uh, so what profit percentage is acceptable to you? Well, I tell you what, I am saying they can make whatever profit they want to make on, you know, there's this thing called whatever the market will bear. And then what we can do as a society when we realize that they're pilfering people, we can then say, okay, and we'll take that profit back through increased taxes that we can recirculate so that we can have that money again back to pay you. Okay, so in other words, a lot of companies say, you don't, we don't want you to control the pricing that we have. Okay, no problem, cost, uh, price, whatever you want. When we're done doing the calculations as far as based on your income, since the income was so excessive, 23% for Johnson & Johnson, profit margin, ridiculous, right? Especially since most of these drugs uh, have a, a huge, huge common component. Most of those drugs are developed by us, the taxpayer. So, Mr. Masticator, I am saying they can charge whatever the hell they want to charge. We'll just tax it back out of them. That's what I want to do. I want, you can have your freedom. Have your freedom. Tax whatever you want. But we, when, when we come to talk about the, the, whatever it's made that, that um, brings down society, we'll just tax it back out. That's the way to handle it. Lee Grant says, health insurance companies show much less profit than big pharma. That is true. But um, th th what they are, uh, and they should, right? I mean, uh, uh, big pharma, if they're honest companies, they're a good thing, right? They, if, uh, uh, an honest big pharma company is out there investing in, in drugs that help people, that heal people. We want those kinds of investments. We want them to do well. But you see what happens with big pharma is the, the interaction between big pharma and Wall Street, remember, Big Pharma is not about the altruistic uh, engineer and medical doctors and, and, and researchers developing good drugs. They, I mean, those are the good people in Big Pharma. All those people that create all these nice drugs and test them, these are great people. The problem is the backing is by the stock guys. Those guys go into these companies, oh, we got to have this sort of a return, we got to... And then they have to do whatever it is to satisfy the crooks. The crooks being the financial portion of the big pharma companies. And that's where the problem lies. That is where the problem lies. Okay, Lee Grant, I wonder how many people have benefited from medicine produced by a large pharmaceutical company. Let's be honest, right? 
big Bayer is a big pharmaceutical company and they make aspirin. So millions of people uh, benefit from uh, big pharma. Okay. Now, uh, oh, I, I may, may, may have misunderstood the question. Health insurance companies show, uh, uh, yeah, how, ma how many more? So, I mean, look, I am not the type of person that just want big pharma to disappear. I want big pharma to be run the way big pharma is, is, should be run. That entity of our society that is attempting to create drugs to make people better, to make people feel better, to make people healthier. That's what we want. The problem is when you have the intersection between big pharma and Wall Street, what you get is uh, big pharma is just a conduit for wealth transfer the Wall Street way. And that is what we have to understand the differences are. A big pharma is nothing. Uh, Wall Street drives big pharma as the conduit to take your money. Wall Street does that with industry after industry. The industry per se is not bad. But when we get to the financial portion of the industry, that is where the badness shows up. Because at that point, they're no longer doing what's necessary, what's good. At that point, they're working for you know whom, just for the mighty dollar to transfer your wealth to them. And since their pie grows at a bigger clip, they have to every year take more and more of what you get, which means in the aggregate, you get less. And in the aggregate, you getting less means several things. And I want to, I want to, I want to make people understand something, right? Because this is very important. Anytime I give that, that speech at nauseum, where I say the wealthy, the top 1%, keeps taking a bigger pie, piece of the pie, a bigger slice of the pie, so that the rest of the pie that has to divide among everybody else shrinks. Here's the kicker, right? We can have a, a calculation that hurts a few people so badly that a lot of folks in the middle have a semblance of marginal prosperity. In other words, if we hurt the bottom 20% horrendously bad and they don't have a voice, and we have the top 1% horrendously well, we can kind of grow that little middle slowly, at a slow clip. Yeah, but it's a slow clip. But still, they have the semblance of things moving forward. And that is how we do things here. We have the classiest way of ripping people off by hurting a few. It is a perfect scenario. You know, it happened in slavery. It happens in capitalism. That is what we do. And when people understand that, they can start to say, ah, we need to make the modification we need to make the modification to our system in such a manner that it makes sense not for a few, but for everybody. So what I want to do is, you, remember uh, today's show is about uh, HR3 as well, the new law, uh, the new bill that Nancy Pelosi wants to put out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell has no interest in touching. And to show you the hoops that they go through, the hoops that they go through, to help these companies. So let me go ahead and get to HR. Oh, well, before I go to HR3, I better answer Benig uh, Benigno Isagni del Rio. I think that's how you say your name. Uh, if, I, if, I, if I bastardize your name, you can slap me right there in the, in the message that you have here. Benigno Isagni, wait, Benigno, Isag Benigno Isagani del Rio. Ram Emanuel's one of the most abhorrent corporate shills alive. I concur. I definitely concur. And it's not only that. Remember when he was a mayor of Chicago, the schools that he closed and who he gave respect to, etc. Not a good person. And people say, well, you worked for Obama. Yeah, but not a good person. Benigno Isagini del Rio also says, certain vital services like health care must not be profit-based, but instead oriented towards the common good. Healthcare is a human right. I could not say that loud enough. You could not say that loud enough. We have to make people believe that. We have to get, you know, the, the Powell Manifesto taught people that, oh, things work better when we have some mythical market that is out there regulating things and it's self-regulating. 
and and they forgot a very important oh i i said it right thank you senor benigno isagani del rio okay i'm glad that i said that right anyhow but yo soy de panama eso es porque lo puedo pronunciar pero me imagino que eso es italiano seems you can tell me if i'm wrong or right or portuguese anyway as it turns out uh it's hard to explain to people that there is, you know, this market that they talk about, forget one important thing. And I, like, I don't like to speak too much about the market self-regulating and as much as I like to talk about price and power. Because price and power does not depend on market forces per se in all instances. And let me give you an example, right? Healthcare, soy mestizo filipino. Okay, no hay problema from the Philippines. Anyway. Uh, let me uh, let me tell you specifically uh, why market forces don't always work, right? And it goes like this: when you, uh, if, if, if in certain f instances in healthcare, market forces, it's impossible for market forces to work. And let me tell you why: if you get sick and you have some disease, it does not matter whether there are a million doctors doing it, two doctors. Whatever they tell you you will pay is what you will sign up to pay to get better. Because at that point, it's not a choice of, well, I don't want that. Let me shop around. It doesn't apply to that. And from a moral standpoint, it shouldn't apply either. Right? It shouldn't apply either. We should feel that if somebody is sick and we have the ability to cure them, that's what we do. We cure them. By the way, folks, you want to call in 646-716-5812. 646-716-5812. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, back to, uh, back to HR3. Let me get back to HR3. It's important. Hello, Bruce. How are you doing, my friend? Uh, welcome aboard. Bruce says, who is making the profits when I pay for generic drugs? that have been marked up for people covered by insurance or pay from their pocket without using the discount cards. How do those cards trigger the cost decrease? Sometimes 90%. You know, Bruce, that is what I call, that is what is so ironic about the system. First of all, how do you feel that, uh, your friend, that you are paying, that the price of something is, let's say, $10, and you know, Bruce, because of who you are, you can get it for one dollar and then you look at your neighbor who is getting that same drug and paying ten dollars for it or eight dollars for it i don't know about you but i that that has a certain stench to me and the reason why it is all things being equal right your expenses tells you what your disposable income is going to be and your disposable income give you certain abilities to do certain things. If because of your unluckiness with healthcare and who you carry for insurance, your disposable income is different than somebody else just because of that. There's a certain level of immorality there. And I'm not only talking about, well, you can take a bigger vacation that I can take because I have the... No, it's not about that. It is just about sickness. I mean, there's just... A, there's a, just there's a certain, uh, there's just a certain mor moral decay when you think about things like that. But who keeps the profit? Look, they keep the drug company keeps all the profits. When you can, when they can discount something by ninety percent, it just shows you the kind of markups we're talking about. And anything over the markup is a profit. Anything over the markup is a profit. Remember what I said. The issue is not about market forces. The issue is one: whatever people will pay. Two, who has price and power. And, and, what is pri and when does price and power end? Price and power ends when I've taken all your income plus all the credit you have access to. At that point, you're the person you are going to buy from, price and power ends because at that point, there's no, he cannot get the price anywhere for you to purchase it. So, I mean, a lot of people sit down and think, wait a minute, price and power. I mean, uh, market, market, market. Forget about market. It's all about price and power. When I sold software uh, and I developed the software and from then on it's a matter of marketing the software, 
the only thing that mattered then was price and power because the cost was already done and so forth. And like I told you in a several shows before, one of the reasons people thought I was so stupid was because I refused to mark these things up for whatever the market will bear. It just seemed seemly. And the reason it seems seemly is that Boeing wasn't going to be paying what I charged them. Boeing was going to be transferring that cost right to the, 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 the person who buys the plane. And the person who buys the plane is going to carry that cost right down to the, per, to the last person without price and power, which is the flying public. You know, and a lot of the flying public are just your average, everyday person trying to make a living. People don't get it. You have, like I said, capitalism has no heart. The people within capitalism have to be the ones with heart. And if they have hearts, then they'll use capitalism as just the tool that it can be. You know, the, the supply and demand part of the tool, etc. And there are some other aspects within the tool that can be used. But they do not use the most egregious portions of the thing. Benigno, okay, let's see. Does pharmacy get a big cut? Uh... There is a thing, yes, actually, these coupons that they give, in fact, pharmacists make, uh, pharmacists, uh, there's a show on it, and, and I should look for the document, because we covered this one before. Pharmacists do get a big cut of the pharmaceutical thing. I mean, there's a, there's a hell of a lot of profit in, in these drugs, and the, and the pharmacy does get a large cut, and if you, if, if you doubt what I'm saying, Notice that if you, if you take a look at CVS at this point in time, what happens a whole lot of times right now is you have CVS saying, hey, guys, uh, it's time for you to up your, 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 your um, drug price. And, you know, you're like, why would they be so interested in sending you these automatic texts? And these automatic texts are for drugs that, like, m m my wife now, because I'm no longer, I, I, I carried our health insurance for 30 years. Now she's carrying it for the job that she has, okay? And, and the first couple of years, which she's, I think she's been doing it now for two or three years, I was in shock. I was used to paying, what, $16,000, dollars a year in insurance or so, so I, somewhere around there, and still paying everything else out of pocket. And when I saw that my drugs that would cost me $100 now cost, wait, Four dollars, really? And I have the insurance and the the, the drug company, not the drug, the pharmaceutical company. As soon as that thirty days is up, they want to sell you more, and it's all automatic. So yeah, it's a fish. It's an efficient thing now. So yeah, they do get a big cut, uh, Bruce. Uh, Benigno Asigno del Rio, Isig. <laughs> Sorry, I did bastard it this time. But anyhow, privatizing healthcare is like privatizing the fire and police department and demanding payment for firefighting and law enforcement services. You're absolutely right. In other words, and you know what? There is a part, uh, there's a town that did just that. And a house caught fire. And it was somebody who had not paid their fire bill. Wouldn't you know they let that house burn? That made it on the news a few years ago. They made that house burn. People don't understand that private, there's nothing healthy about privatization. Now, okay, Elizabeth Hardin says, Medicare for all. Elizabeth, I'm on your side, my dear friend. Medicare for all, you're absolutely right. Okay, here's what I want to do. I want to, because I'm running out of time here, so let me go ahead and get to the HR3 title. The HR3 uh, bill is actually known as the Lower Drug. The Lower Drug Cost Now Act, okay? Now, that bill says the following. Uh, that bill says, yeah, everything is covered on the Medicare for All. Absolutely everything. You go with a card to your doctor and everything is covered. The way you pay your, your insurance is it's taxes, right? Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're trying to get Elizabeth Warren like hell. I mean, all the reporters are trying to get her to say, I am going to raise your taxes with Medicare for All, and she refuses to say it, and I hope she continues to refuse to say it because I want her to call going forward medical insurance a tax. And if she calls medical insurance a tax, then she says, will your taxes go up? The answer is no. 
medical insurance is a tax. Everybody that is listening to me right now, let's put this into the sphere. Because the health insurance companies calls it, you know, you, because you have to have health insurance, right? Let's call health insurance a tax. And let's put that out throughout the blogosphere, throughout social media. Health insurance is a tax. And let's make that wildly known. And the reason we want to do that is, Elizabeth, listen to what I'm saying, why I'm saying that. When we call health insurance a tax, when Elizabeth Warren, when they try to knock Elizabeth Warren as saying she's going to raise your taxes, she can go out there and say, I will be lowering your taxes. Why? If health insurance is a tax, and the way we are going to cover Medicare for all going forward is a tax, then we will be lowering your taxes. It's important. Remember what goes on here. It's all about narrative. And these guys are very good at narrative, something that in progressives are generally very poor at. So we have to start defining health insurance as a tax. The only bad thing about the tax is it's a tax that's paid to the private sector. Now we are going to pay this tax to the public sector. Let's keep, the, let's, let's keep that narrative, folks. Help me out here. Help me out here. That is the narrative going forward. Health insurance is a tax. And Elizabeth, I understand what you're saying when you say, yeah, but you're going to still pay less. That is how she's been putting it out there. But the narrative that comes out after that is there, oh, she's being dubious with her words. We want her words to mean something. So if we define health insurance as a tax, then she can say the taxes will be lowered when you become. And by the way, learn MMT. Uh, I, I, I know a whole lot about MMT. Um, uh, modern monetary theory, I love it. In fact, we're practicing it now. We only practice it, though, for wealthy people. We expand the money supply and we spend whatever we need to give tax cuts, but we are not willing to spend whatever we need to do infrastructure, which is what MMT would have uh, had us been doing right now, to put it bluntly. Okay, let's go over uh, HR3 real quickly. HR3 says, every year, every year, the secretary would identify 250 brand name drugs that lack price competition with the greatest cost to Medicare and the whole system. The secretary would use data provided by Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial insurance to make the determination about aggregate costs, which is a measure of price and volume sales. An eligible drug that lacks competition would be defined as a brand name drug that does not have a generic or biosimilar competitor on the market. Insulin would also be included for negotiation. The overwhelming uh, volume of costs in Medicare is disproportionately concentrated in a segment of drugs that would be eligible for negotiation for the first year. But here's a kicker about what Nancy Pelosi's law would do now. 250 drugs. They're going to find 250 drugs that doesn't really have a whole lot of competition. And they said, we're going to negotiate on those drugs. But guess what she does? She limits it to 25 drugs per year. Do you get the kind of corruption that can occur when you limit the market, when you limit what the government can negotiate to 25 drugs per year? Okay? So this thing that shows, it sounds very good. We are going to negotiate drug prices, but only 25 of them per year. And the reason she's only going to do 25 per year is because they may not have enough people in HHS to handle it. Come on, Nancy. We can hire people to bring down drug prices if that's what it takes and handle all 250 of them. And you would think these guys, you know, uh, they always talk about how big the market is, the healthcare market is. We could save a lot of money if we did that, but no. But here's the other kicker. There's a part of the bill that also says, uh, how will we figure out pricing? We'll take the, and they take these five Western countries, add them all up, and divide them and go ahead and say, our cost cannot be more than 120% of the average of these, these countries. Why are you telling us that our prices have to be higher than these countries? Why? 
why aren't we saying that our cost? Why, why aren't we saying that since our market is so large, our cost should be the cost of the lowest country? Why aren't we saying that? Again, to protect the drug companies. I have it. Po I have HR three posted in the blog post for the show. You may want to go ahead and see that because what I want to do now is go ahead and uh, play the, the the little piece here on MMT. Okay, Elizabeth Warren is practicing. Uh, incrementalism actually that's not elizabeth warren uh, elizabeth warren is not the one of the bill this bill was put up by nancy pelosi if i said elizabeth warren i'm incorrect elizabeth warren won full-blown medicare for all that's what she's pushing uh and if, if you know something that i don't score me up uh, bruce said there are other things the government could do to lower uh costs base uh lower the base cost of living i agree with you pelosi is not an honest actor she takes big form of money you're absolutely correct uh, senor benigno isagno isagani del rio you're absolutely correct uh, let's see who uh, bruce also says your cost of living will go down she gets it yes she gets it i like calling it the cost of living i agree with you now what what i'm saying though bruce and i, I i'd like you to tell me if you agree and and also elizabeth i'd like you to tell me if you agree the narrative that, uh, that they want to put on a bumper sticker is as follows. Uh, Medicare for all is going to raise your taxes by a bunch. And that's true. The taxes that you're going to pay is going to be raised by a bunch. Comparatively. But here is the thing. Here is the thing. You won't have co-pays anymore. You won't have premiums anymore. So if you call premiums, co-pays, a tax, because you have to pay them, then when they ask you, are taxes going to go up or down with Medicare for All, you can say taxes go down for Medicare for All. But anyhow, I want to show you how dishonest even the centrist portion of the Democratic Party is. Uh, I'm going to go to the next cut i played this before but there are many people that are here that haven't seen it so let me go ahead and play this to show you the crookedness that occurs even in the democratic party here we go colorado senator michael bennett is at it again of course he does not support medicare for all do you notice that there are a group of democrats that are coming into the presidential race on the democratic side uh, supposedly uh, supporting policies that support uh, the average American citizen, the middle class, the poor, but they are out there carrying water. They are nothing but the wards of the plutocracy. If they are not supporting Medicare for all and somehow they attempt to tell Americans that that will not solve our health care problem, uh, they are pretty much lying to the American people however they try. I want you to listen to what Michael Bennett had to say today on uh, Meet the Press and a few weeks ago on Morning Joe. There are several people that entered the primary. They know they don't have a chance of winning, but they are in there as the wards of the insurance companies, of the wards of the medical industrial complex for one reason only, to skew the debate, to assure that when the Democrats finally come out, they, they finally come and kill, or, or they finally are so scared of Medicare for all because you have these others involved, that they leave it alone. We cannot allow that to work. I want you to listen to this and we'll take it on the other side. My suggestion on Medicare X that creates a true public option administered by Medicare rather than take, threatening to take away insurance from 180 million people, 80% of whom like it, all the unions in America that have negotiated for their health care plans. I mean, I think that the American people have waited long enough for universal health care. Some are talking about Medicare for all. Would you support that approach? I, I don't support that approach. If what you're talking about is the legislation that Bernie Sanders has in the Senate, that would take insurance away from 180 million people who get it through their employer, 80% of whom like it. It would take insurance away from every labor union in America that's negotiated a health care plan, and it would cost $30 trillion. I have a bill with Tim Kaine called Medicare X that would create a true public option for the American people. This gives the American people a choice that doesn't force Force them into plan. It gives them an option, and it, uh, it creates competition for private insurance, starting in rural areas. As I said, I think that's much closer to where the American people are than wanting to have the government take over the entire healthcare system. 
hear that? A Democrat speaking right wing talking points. Democratic takeover of the healthcare system, and we're going to take away uh, uh, private insurance that 180 million Americans love, and somehow the unions are going to not benefit from this. He used all the key points to try to tie progressive, uh, progressive issues with right wing issues, which means insurance companies, etc. Look, first of all, let's be frank. Mathematically speaking, if you have a bill to pay, and you also have to pay for the shareholders, executives, advertising, and all of that. It is impossible. Folks, this is a mathematical issue. The only reason for private insurance companies is to somehow make sure that they can make a cut of what you pay or the government pay, meaning you as well, in premiums. There are no two ways about it. It's a mathematical certainty that it is impossible for you to have a more efficient system than a single payer system. Then they talk about, oh, well, it's a monopoly. What do you think the insurance companies have? When they talk about waiting times, right now, anybody who has private insurance, try to get a specialist for the vast majority of people. Try to see a doctor for the vast majority of people. We don't have rationing by the government. We have rationing by private companies whose sole purpose is to make a profit. Do not be fooled with all this calculated language that they're using on you. They're using a tactical form of speech to convince you that it is best for you to give your money to the insurance companies and the, and the shareholders of those companies. We cannot allow any Democrat running to make these arguments. They can come and say they are not necessarily for Medicare for All in the form that it's written right now, but if they're coming to say, we want the private insurance company to continue pilfering you, we must ensure not only that they don't make it, but that they do not get a chance to change the debate, lest we remain in the status quo and we cannot move forward with health care. Friends, please click the button here. and. Okay, no click the button there. I didn't realize that, that that video had that little piece in there. So, But anyhow, so you, you get it. Um, look, we are close to, uh, to the end of the show right now. And I really appreciate every, all the input that I got. Let me see. Elizabeth says, leaving private insurance will leave substandard health care for the rest. They will weasel their way out of providing for everyone. We already have concierge care. Health care is not a capitalist commodity. And there's something else, Elizabeth. I love that you said that because that is beautiful. The other thing is what they would do is the following, right? They'll insure you and they'll write their policy in such a manner that, it, yes, it renews every single year. But they may put clauses in there that says, okay. But after a year, let's say you have uh, uh, cancer of some sort, they're not going to renew your policy. They didn't rescind it because it's illegal to rescind the policy, but they just don't renew the policy, right? And then uh, unless th that law remains that says anybody who comes to you for health care will get it, but you know that government, uh, they're going to buy their way out of that or, or, or they'll try to find a way to weasel you into the government program if you get sick so that the government is filled with just the sick people which means their costs would be higher then the then after the, the costs are higher because the private insurance kind of teeth everybody over to the government sector if they're sick uh, they go ahead and advertise later oh but look how inefficient the government system is why you need to keep the private sector it's a whole it's a circular firing squad that they use against the government. Anyhow, Bruce says, I think increments for health care would, uh, would be one, Medicare, we already have it. Two, you can select to be in Medicare, but pay whatever I paid before I turned 65. And then I think three will happen. Private insurance will become like the add-on I have to cover med that what Medicare does not. Um, I, I partially agree, uh, but Medicare is, for a lot of people, if you don't have money, Standard Medicare is not enough given the 20% that you have to come up with and the donut hole and all of that. I think all of those things have to be closed. And when you close all those things, in effect, what you've just broken it down to is Medicare for all for choice. And in other words, something similar to what Buttigieg is coming out with, which is Medicare for all if you want it. Okay, Benigno Isagani del Rio says, simple, instead of paying inflated health insurance premiums, co-pays, etc., you pay a single month of tax that is actually much lower. There's a net reduction in health care costs. That's exactly what happens. Good points. I will ponder this. Elizabeth, uh, that is disaster. 
that is disaster insurance companies must be eliminated. Look, let me tell you what I, what I like before. Instead of saying uh, eliminate the insurance companies, here's what I would suggest, Elizabeth. I suggest that we, we say insurance, if, we are, if we're doing x-rays, insurance companies cannot insure x-rays, right? Because, first of all, the, it's an absolute certainty that x-rays plus profit plus advertising budget plus all of that is going to be more expensive than x-rays. So I'm saying let the clowns stay in business. Let them stay in business. They cannot survive because mathematically speaking, it's impossible. Let me give an example. Uh, the government will only pay for, I mean, the, the price for an x-ray under the government is what the x-ray costs, right? All the expenses for the x-ray or and whatever, what it costs. It's a cost. Uh, given the way profit works and how it has to percolate to the executives, to the banking system, to the banking fees, to the distributors, to the to the uh, to the uh, cor to the shareholders, it is mathematically impossible for them to beat the government and stay alive. It's not. Look, I I think it's an argument that we don't even have to have. Because it's a mathematical impossibility for them to be able to offer service at a lower cost. And guess what? I'm one minute over, and this stuff is in syndication, which means I got to cut some of it out. So here we go. Uh, beforehand, I did just do need to do my plug. Folks, please remember this is a show that requires or needs your support. Please go to patreon.com slash politics and right. It's on the screen, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com slash politics and right. Support us. It's, it's, it's inexpensive, less than a cup of coffee a month. And what you do is you ensure that we can continue doing this and expand the horizon. The only way people are going to start understanding the truth and not just listening to what they hear on TV is for many of us small media outlets like what we do to be able to get the job done. We are out there putting this out. And even after we are done with the live program, this is going to see, be seen by thousands more. It's going to be heard by thousands more because we are also syndicated with some other uh, online entities. And you know what's great about that? In as much as we make zero on those, we get the message out. All of us that are in these networks depend on our individual supporters supporting us to further get the message out. So please go to patreon.com slash politics done right to support us or just go to politics done right .com and support us. My name is Egberto Willis and I want to thank you guys so kindly for spending the time with me. I want to thank you so kindly for being here all the time. I want to ask you to share us, make sure other people see us. Encourage other people to subscribe to us because what we're doing here has to be done if we're going to make this a better place. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics Done Right. I knew how I end this. Baby, I am what? Out! Welcome to Politics Done Right. I am your host, Egberto Willis. This is the progressive program that will take the mystery out of politics. This is the program that will encourage you to make sure government becomes we the people. Whether you are liberal, conservative, or otherwise, you get to air your point of view. Remember, you can also send me a tweet to E-G-B-E-R-T-O-W-I-L-L-I-E-S that is at Egberto Willie. Let us engage. It is politics done right. One, two, three, four.